Yeah, there you are. Hi there. Welcome to the National Press Club, the place where news happens. My name is Allison Fitzgerald Kojak. I'm a correspondent at NPR News here in Washington. I'm also the Press Club's 112th president. We're so pleased today to welcome our headliner speaker, CBS News correspondent Scott Pellet. Before we begin, I'd like to uh, ask you all once again to please turn off your cell phones. And if you're following along um, today on Twitter, you can uh, check the hashtag NPC Live. Truth Worth Telling. That's the name of Scott Pelley's new book. It might also be called History Worth Watching. In his more than two decades at CBS, Pelley has had a front row seat to so many events that have shaped our time, from the Oklahoma City bombing to Bill Clinton's first presidential campaign to the September 11th attacks on the World Trade Center in New York. He was so close there that he was literally covered in ash. And in this book, he uses those experiences to define the, the importance of truth. He defends our free speech. And as one reviewer writes, offers inspiring tales that remind us of the importance of values in our lives. <clears throat> Excuse me. Scott has done it all at CBS. He was a war reporter, a White House correspondent, an evening news anchor, and a 60 Minutes host. The list of honors and awards he's received is far too long to read here, but I will say that he must have a large room in his house to, have, uh, to house all that hardware. So let's just give a warm National Press Club welcome today to the Scott Pelley. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. You know, uh, Allison, I can't tell you what a treat this is, what a great treat this is. Not, not the event. The, the lunch. The lunch. The yes, thing. because I, I have, uh, my wife and I have a place in Texas, so we go to a lot of Texas restaurants. She never, ever lets me order the chicken fried steak. <laughs> so today I can tell her, honey, that was all they had. Well, so thank you for that. <laughs> can you just uh, start out, just set the table. Um, this book is a series of stories, things that you have covered, and you assign each chapter, each story, a sort of value or virtue or uh, word of uh, describing its importance. Can you tell me the concept behind it? Absolutely. It's, a, it's an unusual kind of memoir. I wanted to write a memoir, but I didn't want to write a memoir about me. Uh, because I knew nobody would be interested in that. If I started a book with, I was born in, Love, uh, in San Antonio, Texas in 1957, and then there were another 500 pages after that, I mean, nobody was going to sit still for that. But it occurred to me that I had met, during the course of my career, the most astounding people, who in many cases exhibited incredible virtues during the most difficult moments of their lives. So the book is organized, as Allison said, really is an anthology of short stories about people uh, and historic events. And the chapters are titled, for the most part, uh, 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 titled with virtues such as gallantry and selflessness and duty and valor and what have you. So the first chapter, for example, is about what I witnessed at the World Trade Center on 9-11. And the name of that chapter is Gallantry. And it's about the firefighters of the FDNY on that day. That was one of the most compelling um, retellings of that morning that I have seen. Um, you went into a huge amount of detail. Um, can you talk a little bit about how much of that was reporting that you did at the time, how much was it? did you reconstruct for this book? Did you go back and do additional work to, to retell that story? There's an enormous amount of research in this book, and, and to tell you the truth, that's what I had the most fun doing. Because when you're an eyewitness to an event like the World Trade Center collapsing, the truth is you don't know very much. You were there, you saw it happen, but you don't know why it happened, you don't know how it happened, you don't know all these things that are only going to be discovered later. For example, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is to building failures what the NTSB is to airplane crashes, they spent 10 years producing 53 engineering reports 
on exactly how the buildings came apart and why they did. That was important because never in human history had a steel high-rise ever collapsed because of fire. The World Trade Center towers were the first two. That's why there were 343 firemen in those buildings when they collapsed, because the fire command had no experience with a high-rise building collapsing. It had never happened. And so digging into all of those things, Allison, understanding uh, why the firemen were in there, what the firefighting plan was. They had a very good plan to save the people above the points of impact. And then going through the 911 calls from people inside the building, going through the fire department radio transmissions. The 911 calls, for example, were sealed by court order for many, many, many years, about 10 years after 9-11, those records became publicly available. So I've been able to scoop up all that stuff that has become known and reported and analyzed over the last many years. It's hard to believe, isn't it? It's almost been 20 years. Um, and then used all of that to inform what I saw with my own eyes. There was, um, I don't want to focus only on that chapter, but there was one tale you tell about a 911 call. And what I was struck by was that the 911 operator stayed on the telephone with this woman who was not going to be rescued in the end for about 30 minutes until she couldn't hear her anymore. And then it was clear that the 911 operator was incredibly personally impacted by this. That was a woman named Melissa Doy. She was a 32-year-old financial analyst. She was on the 83rd floor of two World Trade Center. And she called 911. And I'll, if I may, I'll just read a, 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 a small piece of that. At the moment the 911 operator answered her call, Doy can be overheard nearing the end of the Hail Mary prayer. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. 911 operator, good day. I'm on the 83rd floor. I'm on the 83rd floor. Doy shouted into the phone. The nose of United Flight 175 had hit two floors below her. Part of the right wing had ripped through Doy's 83rd floor. The 24-minute conversation between Melissa Candida Doy and a 911 operator is among the few in which we have the caller's words. The city of New York had released the other 911 recordings, but only you hear only the voice of the dispatcher in those cases. They took the voices of the callers out. But the reason we have this one, the recording was entered into evidence in the 2006 federal trial of Zacharias Massawi, a Frenchman, who ultimately pleaded guilty to conspiring with the 911 hijackers, 9-11 hijackers. Massawi will spend the rest of his days in the federal supermax prison in Colorado. Ma'am, how you doing? The operator speaking to Missy Doy was a woman. Listening to the recording, I suspect she's middle-aged and experienced. Her voice is earnest and empathetic. Are you going to be able to get somebody up here? Doy asked. I'm struck by the youth in Doy's pleading soprano. Of course, ma'am. We're coming up to you. Well, there's no one here yet, and the floor is completely engulfed. We're on the floor, and we can't breathe, and it's very, very, very hot. The rest of that sequence in the chapter uh, details a firefighter named Oreo Palmer. He was a battalion chief. Palmer is leading the entire rest of the FDNY up the only staircase that survived the impact of the aircraft. And no one who heard Palmer's voice was surprised that it was him because Oreo Palmer was an accomplished marathon runner and won the FDNY fitness medal every year. He was blazing the trail, rising up toward Missy Doy. Before Palmer's radio uh, recordings were discovered, they had been lost for a period of time. No one knew they existed. Before they were discovered, it was estimated that no firefighter had gotten higher than the 50th floor. 
<laughs> but from uh, Palmer's radio transmissions, we know that he ascended at least to the 79th floor. He was rising toward Melissa Doy at a rate of one floor a minute, telling the firefighters behind him which path to take. And as he encountered survivors, he would tell them how to get down to the 40th floor, which was where the only working elevator was. Anyway, I'll let you read the rest of it in the book, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, as we all know, uh, one hell of a story. So um, we, we got a few questions uh, before you came here. So there's a lot of people who have a lot of things they want to talk about. We'll start with questions about the book um, and moved on to the state of journalism and to CBS. Um, but this person says, in the book you discuss values, virtues, and vices you see in America. What's the most important value, virtue, and vice you see today? Well, character is destiny. That is inescapable, and it's one of the subjects of the book. There's a chapter in the book about the 2016 election, and it's called Hubris, and it applies to both sides in this case. Um, but uh, what concerns me a great deal right now, Allison, about the, the state of discourse is the harshness of the rhetoric, particularly directed against the press by the president, but also harsh rhetoric from the left as well. I think we're, we're losing our ability to communicate with one another. Um, it's terribly worrying. When I was anchoring the CBS Evening News in the president's first term, many of you will remember these were interesting days for us as journalists because we weren't used to a, a president that was telling falsehoods every day. And so we're having conversations in our newsroom, just like you did, about, well, can we say lie? Can we say that the president lied? Is that okay? I mean, you know, we were talking about style issues that had never come up before. So we were very frank, as many people were, but we were very frank on the CBS Evening News about when the president was lying and when he was not. Well, then the president calls CBS News and others the enemy of the American people. So... I was invited with some other anchors to have lunch with the president a couple of weeks later, and I said, you know, Mr. President, I'm concerned about the enemy of the American people. I mean, attack the press, please do, but that kind of thing might incite some poor, deranged individual to go into a local TV station or a newspaper and shoot the receptionist because she's the enemy of the American people. And he actually looked up at the ceiling and thought for a second, and he looked me in the eye and he said, I don't worry about that. That's a direct quote. Now, I thought, okay, he's performing for the table. I get it. There's an audience of 12 people here, et cetera. So I pulled him aside after the lunch very privately, and I said, no, seriously, Mr. President, I'm very concerned about the violence problem and... I hope you'll think about it. And he said, okay, I'll think about it. Well, he didn't change any of the rhetoric. Fast forward now a year, I get a call from the FBI. The FBI is telling me that the guy who mailed all those letter bombs uh, to people he perceived to be enemies of the president had a file on me and my family in his computer, and he had my home address. So this is too much, and not just... Not just, I mean, we have the gentleman from the committee to protect right here. Um, you know, we're, we're used to this kind of violence uh, against journalists in some parts of Asia, in, in some parts of the Middle East. It can't be here. There's no democracy without journalism. That's what the founders knew. When they gave us the power over the government, the founders created free speech and a free press because, as Madison said, freedom of the press is the right that guarantees all the others. They understood 230 years ago that if we could say what we wanted to say, read what we want to read, write what we want to write, then all of our rights would be protected. That's why it's up there in the First Amendment. And so the... Uh, Political rhetoric right now, I think, really needs to get toned down, particularly with regard to journalists, because journalism is integral to the functioning of every democracy, and certainly the United States. 
I'll applaud that as well. And I, I know I'm taking a risk saying something like that at the National Press Club. <laughs> but uh, some things are just harsh. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you talk about this in the final chapter of the book, which is To a Young Journalist. Um, and you, you, you talk about the importance of journalism, the importance of truth-telling, and also the dangers of bad information, the proliferation of bad information. Can you talk a little bit more about that? You know, this worries me more right now in my life than anything else in terms of a threat to our country. We have gone, and we've all seen it, we have gone from the information age to the disinformation age. And that was a huge departure that I think the American people may not be fully aware of. We live in an age where never before in human history has more information been available to more people. That's a wonderful thing. But we also live in an age where never in human history has more bad information been available to more people. That's where journalism comes in, right? We're the antidote to gossip, right? That's what we're supposed to be. That's where journalism comes in. And so this is a very troubling period. Uh, and I tell young journalists that there has been a revolution in distribution that we all know so well, but that does not mean there's been a revolution in the rules for content. Those rules never change. It doesn't matter if you're working on a stone tablet or a glass tablet, those rules never change. Is it right? Is it fair? Is it honest? And just because you don't read the newspaper on paper anymore, that doesn't mean our values and ethics as journalists have changed. So that's what I'm trying to tell young people today because I think it's so very important that they understand the values that all of us in this room share and carry that forward because, again, as Madison saw so clearly, it is freedom of the press that guarantees our liberty. And in that chapter, you describe an experiment with, that you did where you right. bought bots bots. Twitter. And yeah, we did a story for 60 Minutes about misinformation, disinformation. So we bought, we bought through an intermediary 5,000 bots from a Russian uh, source. And the bots masquerade as real people on Twitter or what have you. So we bought, it cost a few hundred dollars to buy 5,000 of these things. Uh, little lines of code, right? What the bots do is they go out into the, the internet universe and collect names and photographs and information. Because of the way our bots were uh, coded, most of them were soccer moms. So now they pop up with Twitter accounts. There's a face, God knows who it is. There's a name, never connected to that face, and a little narrative about who they are and where they live in America. This is all false. None of this is true. So now we got 5,000 of them, and then we program them to retweet anything that I tweet. So I send out a tweet that says, what happens when 60 Minutes um, investigates fake news? And normally, I would expect to get, uh, you know, 100 retweets in a day or something like that. This guy we were working with, our expert, set the bots loose. And the retweets just went up into the thousands. And once it hit a certain point, enough real people began to notice that they just took over. It was like setting my tweet off on a rocket. So. What if my message wasn't so innocuous? And what if I bought a million bots instead of the 5,000 that I bought for a few hundred dollars? This is what the Russian GRU was doing, right? And they have unlimited resources, really. At one point, it was March Madness time. So just for fun, I sent the tweet out again, hashtag March Madness. We instantly became one of the top three trending subjects on the March Madness website. Had nothing to do with basketball, except I wrote hashtag March Madness. So th these are the kinds of things I think most people don't know about, and we have to become educated about them, because we have enormous responsibilities as journalists, but more than ever before, 
our readers and our viewers have got to take responsibility for what they're consuming and what they believe. And I don't think 99% of the American people realize that. That when they're looking, I'm just making this up off the top of my head, when they're looking at AmericansForAmerica.com, it's a GRU lieutenant in, in uh, St. Petersburg. I don't think many people understand that. How do we get people to understand that? I mean, that, that seems to me the hurdle that is almost insurmountable. Talk about it, report about it, investigate it, investigate it, investigate it, put it in the real media. When people come to me and say, well, what am I supposed to do? I, this is very self-serving, and I, I'm 62 years old, I would say this, but um, I tell them to go to brand name media. You know, and I it, let it be ABC, let it let it be the Washington Post, let it be the the Chicago Tribune. I don't care what brand name media you're interested in or where you are on the spectrum. But the one thing you know from brand name media is that there are journalists who are trained working there. They're being supervised by people who've been doing this for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And most importantly, they're they have enormous reputational risk if they get something wrong. They really care if they get something wrong. And so I tell people that if you see something on the internet and you are just outraged by this terrible atrocity, go see what CBS News has reported on that subject. Go see what the Washington Post has said about that subject or, or NPR. You may discover that that thing actually never happened. And the beauty part is that that has never been easier in human history. You can, you can do that kind of a spot check if you care about a story in a matter of seconds. That's a great thing. Um, I'm going to go back to some of these questions. Um, this person writes, having held the anchor job once occupied by Walter Cronkite, often called the most trusted man in America, do you think that era is over in this cynical world in which many people embrace? Is it possible that one journalist or any one person could ever have that level of trust again? Definitely over and definitely a good thing. <laughs> cynicism, cynicism is not a good thing. But I write a lot in the book about skepticism, which is something that all of us have been trained to exercise as journalists. I think our viewers and our readers don't exercise skepticism nearly to the degree that we should, uh, that we do. Um, after, during and after Walter, I mean, look at, look at those times, right? Vietnam, Watergate, all of those things that were happening that Walter was reporting about were creating in the American people, unfortunately, a little bit of cynicism about the media and about our, the, the power structures, particularly in Washington. So I think it is a good thing that no single journalist or two or three are going to be considered the most trusted person, especially for all the reasons that we just discussed. Um, we need to earn the trust of the public, and I encourage the public to be skeptical about what we're telling them and to do their own research. This is a question about local news. There's so few local newspapers, um, at least with the kind of voice and power that they used to have, regional papers, city papers. Um, how do you think changes like this affect journalism broadly um, and affect those communities? Well, it's the communities that I'm concerned about. Um, this, this is something that we're going to have to find a way to address as a society. Because all the things I said earlier about there being no democracy without journalism apply on the local level. It applies to the city council and the city manager and the cops in the little town. I mean, how is corruption going to be ferreted out in these, these smaller towns, these small school districts, things like that? How is that going to happen if it isn't for reporters who know that town and know those people and are able to dig into those facts? I live, I have a home in a, in a small New England town called Darien, Connecticut. And Darien, for whatever reason, is about 20,000 people. It has two local newspapers, uh, which is like the most amazing thing. And they just give the school district hell about funding and where the money goes and all of that sort of thing. And every time the paper comes in, I think, right, 
go get them. You know, tell that truth. And uh, Darianne, unfortunately, is a very, very, uh, uh, is a rather unique place in that way. And I very much worry about local papers, local radio, local television stations. I, I started in Lubbock, Texas, working first for the Avalanche Journal newspaper and then the ABC TV station there. And who is going to ferret out corruption in towns like Lubbock if you don't have robust journalism? It is a question that must be answered. Okay, I'm going to turn a little bit because somebody mentioned on one of these that you started at the Lubbock Avalanche. Avalanche Journal. Avalanche the, uh, Journal when Lubbock, you were 15 years old. Lubbock sits on a tabletop mesa where there is no danger of anything ever rolling downhill. <laughs> And so I asked about the odd name of the newspaper, and I was informed that it was supposed to be an avalanche of news on your doorstep. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, okay then, that makes sense. I, you know, um, Allison, my, my career in search of the truth began with a lie. Um, I wanted to get a job at the paper because I really wanted to be a photographer. I wanted to work at National Geographic. But the paper only hired kids that were 16 and above, and I had this temporal problem. I was 15. <laughs> so I lied about my age. I got the job as a copy boy working the three to midnight shift after high school, uh, every day after high school classes. My mom was my co-conspirator. She dropped me off a couple of blocks from the paper so that nobody could see I didn't have a driver's license. <laughs> and I worked in the wire room for a... Uh, uh, for a period of time, for about a year. One day, the executive editor of the paper come, comes in. His name was Dave Knapp. He was a big barrel-chested guy, always wore a white shirt, had a silver crew cut and kind of Marine Corps bearing. And I'm in the wire room working on my high school homework. And Knapp comes in, he looks down at me, and he says, do you want to be a reporter? And I said, well, I, I don't know. I never gave it any thought. He said, well, do you or don't you? And I said, well, sure, I guess. And he picked me up, sat me in front of a typewriter, which I had no idea how to operate, and I've been a reporter ever since. So no photography. So that was the end of my <laughs> photography career, although it is, it's a cherished hobby. And I, uh, I may try to publish some of the pictures one day. But, uh, but uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's what set me on the track to be a reporter. Okay. I'm going to turn back to the book for a moment, because we're talking about lies. Um, somebody asked about the white, covering the White House, but you've gone into that a little bit. Uh, already. Um, here, you have a chapter called Deceit, the fabulous Mr. Clinton. And I'm interested that you called that chapter Deceit when we have Mr. Trump in the White House now. Can you talk a little bit about that choice? Well, you know, only one chapter could be named Deceit, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and one chapter could be named Hubris, and I guess when I wrote them, I just split them up that way. I, uh, uh, I was... Uh, I was the chief White House correspondent at the White House during the whole Lewinsky matter. I, I remember when I first got the job at the White House, naturally very excited about it. I sat in the little booth there that CBS has over in the West Wing behind the, behind the uh, briefing room, and I remember sitting there thinking to myself, boy, I hope something interesting happens while I'm here. <laughs> and then six months later... So Bill Owens, who is now the executive producer of 60 Minutes, was my producer at the White House. Bill used to work for me, now I work for him. And uh, so we worked very hard to break stories on the Lewinsky matter, and the president, of course, was wor working very hard to, to lie to the country. The difference we have today is that uh, our current president tells falsehoods about just about everything, including policy. Uh, Mr. Clinton kind of stuck to one subject matter when he was <laughs> when he was when he was lying to the country which in retrospect could be considered to be laudable at this point but uh, Bill and I broke a lot of stories uh, and we we talk about how we did it in the book uh, including the story that we broke on the evening news that the president had for the first time in history been subpoenaed to testify by a grand jury um, one of the things that I found interesting in the chapters that I did read of this were the nuance that you brought to each story. When you're talking now about how people sort of 
are oppositional rather than able to see nuance. And the chapter on Ben Bernanke um, called Audacity. I mean, there's a lot of anger toward the Fed and the Treasury and the policies that bailed out banks during that time. But you really took a, a close look at what what they were going through in that chapter. And i just interested, because it was something I covered at the time as well, um, you know, how you chose him as an example of audacity. Mm -hmm. I, I, I spoke to him recently, and I told him I'd, write, I'd written a chapter about him in my book, and it was entitled Audacity, and he said, well, that'll come as a surprise to my wife. <laughs> Um, He's very mild mannered. Uh, very, very mild manner. I described him in the book as nebbishy. You know, he's just—he's—he's he's every inch the economics professor that he is. But here, here's the lucky accident of history. Um, when it, late 2007, early 2008, when uh, the world was going to hell in a handbasket, and all of you remember that, Ben Bernanke was chairman of the Federal Reserve and. Before he was appointed to that job, he, he had spent his entire life as an academic, as an economics professor and, and the head of, uh, of the economics department at Princeton. He was considered to be one of, if not the leading expert in the world on the causes of the Great Depression in 1929, which is a very complicated thing. It's not as simple as the stock market crashing in October of that year. Uh, and the Federal Reserve had a great deal to do in 1929 with turning a garden variety recession into a world cataclysm. So the reason that I wrote this story about Ben Bernanke is that he recognized what was happening. He said publicly that this was the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression, but that is not what he believed. He thought this was going to be the worst financial crisis in human history because the, all of the financing for every business, every walk of life, all around the world was freezing solid. So Bernanke essentially did the opposite, the 180 degree opposite of everything the Federal Reserve did in 1929. And he flooded the system with money, trillions of dollars. Literally, in an interview with me, admitted he was just printing money, just pouring trillions of dollars on this nuclear pile, like water on a nuclear pile. The White House was in gridlock. The Congress had voted uh, against the bailout plan. So they're in gridlock. And Bernanke doesn't need anyone's permission, right? He's the only free player in this whole thing. He didn't need anybody's permission. When the Banking Act was rewritten in 1935 as a reaction to the Great Depression, there were emergency powers granted to the Federal Reserve, what are called 13C powers. They had never been invoked, not during the Great Depression, not at any time after that. Bernanke invoked the 13C powers secretly. He didn't make an announcement about that because he was afraid it would lead to panic. And then he used those powers unilaterally, in concert with his board, but unilaterally, to um, affect all of this money flow into the world economy. Just sent airplane loads of money to, federal, uh, to uh, central banks uh, all around the world. Because the dollar is the world currency of trade. And central banks all around the world didn't have any dollars anymore. They couldn't buy a car from America if they wanted to. So he sent money everywhere, all around the world, pumped trillions of dollars into the U.S. economy. A lot of that debt is still on the Federal Reserve uh, balance sheet today. And one of the big issues is how do you unwind that? But here's what Bernanke thought. If I don't do this, we're ruined. If I do do this... The economy might improve, and then we can pay for all this. And that is exactly what happened. All those huge bailouts that you heard about that made you so mad back in those days, they've all been paid back with interest. Billions of dollars have flowed into the Treasury in interest payments on those bailout deals that we did to save the car companies and that sort of thing. It turned out to be a huge moneymaker for the American people. But Bernanke understood that uh, 
he understood the Great Depression. He saw it happening again. He saw the White House in gridlock. He saw Capitol Hill in gridlock. And he just went ahead and did what he thought was right. And I believe, reasonable people will disagree, but I believe that Ben Bernanke saved the world. I'm going to just talk about one more chapter, which is called Objectivity, Learning from Unpleasant Truth. And in that chapter, you talk about how um, in the, quote, precision bombings in Afghanistan, there were a lot of reports of terrorists being killed, enemy fighters being killed, and no reports of civilians being killed, at least um, official reports out of the United States. And you went to check this out. You were in Afghanistan. And you found that, of course, lots of civilians were killed. But then you went further, and I thought this was fascinating in this sort of nuance. You look at how the military calculates how many civilians are worth sacrificing to kill foreign fighters or terrorists. And then you and even a step further and sort of showed the difficulty they had making those decisions on the ground. And I just thought that chapter had so many layers. Well, thank you for that. Uh, the the cent Central Command was reporting all of these successful bombing runs and 25 terrorists were killed and no, no civilians, et cetera, et cetera. However, we're hearing from the Afghan people that hundreds and hundreds of civilians are being killed in many of these uh, many of these bombing runs. So those two things didn't match up, and I began to wonder about that. Killing a lot of civilians is an enormous problem for our military because it runs counter to counterinsurgency. We're trying to win the hearts and minds of these people, and instead we're enraging them against the government that we're trying to support. So this is a huge problem for American strategy. I sent one of my producers, Solly Granitstein, into this, and he discovered that there was one bombing in particular that the Pentagon did not want to talk about and wouldn't release information on. And so we went to that place in Capisa province um, with no military support. They wouldn't take us there. We had to hire our own machine gun toting mercenaries and put our own convoy together to get up into Kapisa province, which is in the foothills of uh, the Hindu Kush, and reach this t small town where we had heard that a family had been killed in a bombing. Long story short, the facts of the matter were these. Uh, a pilot saw two men with rifles running into a home. The response to that was that the on-scene commander on the ground asked the Air Force to bomb the house. Now, the problem with this is that you're stuck with whatever the plane is loaded with. There are planes orbiting overhead all the time in case our troops need air cover. And whatever's on the plane is what you've got to use. Well, there was a B-1B bomber in the neighborhood loaded with two 2,000-pound bombs, blockbusters. So they dropped them both on a mud house, killed three generations of a family. Now, when... We, we pounded on the Pentagon to talk to us about it, pounded on them, pounded on them. They would not do it. Total stonewall, not talking about it. First of all, I don't think they have the right to not talk about it because it's not that the Pentagon isn't talking to 60 Minutes. They're not talking to the American people. That's the problem. I'm just a conduit for that information. Finally, for some reason that's obscure, the Air Force finally called back and said, okay, we'll talk about it. So we flew to Qatar, where there was a secret U.S. air base, and uh, interviewed the people who prosecute the air war. And they uh, described uh, very legitimately all of the problems and the rules of engagement and the difficulty that they have in making determinations. You know, there was a time when a bomb would go amiss and it would hit a target that was unintended. That's not really what happens anymore. With our smart weapons, they hit the thing they're aimed at. The problem is a problem of intelligence. You're going to hit that building unfailingly, but do you really know what's in that building? That's the problem. Is it the right building? And so um, they explained all of those things to us. There was a, they, I kept telling the Pentagon, look, you've got a story to tell. 
And they finally told their story, and it gave us that kind of balance that we wanted. We also interviewed a guy who was in charge of high-value targeting before the war in Iraq. And there was a campaign before the war, before the invasion in 2003, to kill Saddam Hussein with an airstrike. The idea was, if we kill Saddam Hussein, then maybe there won't be a war at all. And so they, um, again, it was a problem of intelligence, but there was a formula, as it was explained to me by the head of high value targeting, that they could kill 20 civilians in a strike against Saddam Hussein. If they, were, if they estimated they were gonna kill more than 20, they had to go to the Secretary of Defense or the President for authorization, but they were generally authorized to kill 20 people and less in their estimate if they got Saddam Hussein. So they did 50 airstrikes on suspected locations of Saddam Hussein, and as we all know, they were 0 for 50. They didn't get him. But they killed something over 200 civilians in the process. Now, I know, every, everybody's shaking their head, I know, but think about this. 2003, we invade Iraq. 300,000 people were killed in the Iraq war. Now, if we'd killed Saddam Hussein and killed 200 civilians in the process, these are the problems that the Pentagon has when they're trying to work out these very, very difficult issues. Can I just read yeah, one I, little thing out of the book? Yeah, and after that, we'll take questions from out here. So you go ahead and so read us a bit. I was chief White House correspondent. As you know, Bill Owens was my producer, who's now executive producer of 60 Minutes. And we went with President Clinton on his state tour of China. And in going on that, that trip, we really wanted to interview a Chinese dissident by the name of Bao Tong. Bao Tong was chief of staff to the Chinese president uh, before Tiananmen Square. He was dead set against sending the military into Tiananmen Square. Um, in order to send the military into Tiananmen Square, three days before that happened, the uh, Chinese hardliners arrested Bao Tong, the chief of staff to the president, put him in prison, put him in solitary confinement, where he remained for many years. When we were traveling with President Clinton to Beijing, Bao had just been released, and we wanted to interview him. Now, what are the chances that a guy who's been in solitary confinement for 17 years is going to, after a few months of liberty, sit down with CBS News and criticize the Chinese government. He was eager to do it. But there was a huge problem. He was being watched 24-7 by the Chinese secret police. I mean, we couldn't set up a camera in a hotel room and have him come to the hotel room. They, they would never allow it. So Bill Owens came up with a plan. Bill Owens designed a plan that would unfold in Purple Bamboo Park, a 115-acre oasis of lakes and lawns in northwest Beijing, an affluent part of the capital where universities are clustered. When we arrived in the park, summer was blossoming. The sky was gauzed by high cirrus. Families in canopied boats drifted along groves of lotuses propelled by gondoliers sculling red oars in a lazy rhythm. One boy, pleased with his cleverness, plucked a broad lotus flower and raised it against the sun like a parasol. Along the edges of the park's concrete trails, bamboo pickets were set up to keep visitors off the carefully tended greens. The gardens that later became Purple Bamboo Park were originally ordered in the year 1577 by Wan Li, the 13th emperor of the Ming Dynasty. On June 27, 1998, Bao Tong ambled down one of the pathways in the park and settled onto a green wooden bench. Across the path, directly opposite Bao, our cameraman, Raleigh Malixi, sat with a camera hidden in a shoulder bag. I came from the opposite direction and sat with Bao. A nearly invisible wireless microphone pinned inside my shirt transmitted our conversation across the path to Raleigh's recorder. There was no telling what would happen next as this soft-spoken man risked everything to test his people's right to be heard. Bao was 59 when he went into prison for revealing state secrets and counter-revolutionary propagandizing. That's the same ambiguous charge that China uses to jail journalists today. Despite prison, 
Bao looked younger than his 66 years. He was slender as a reed, nodding in the lake. He wore a teal polo shirt, untucked, hanging loosely over black trousers. His smooth face was dominated by outsized sil silver wire-rimmed glasses. I had noticed that Bao tended to walk, holding his arms behind his back as if handcuffed. He surprised me with a complete lack of bitterness about his years in solitary. He said isolation had liberated his mind from Communist Party dogma. Bao began, quote, According to our Constitution, I have the freedom of speech. However, whether I do indeed have the freedom of speech, I do not know. I think CBS can conduct a test. Let's see whether I get into trouble after your interview with me. If so, it will demonstrate that our government does not respect our own Constitution. What should Americans understand about the struggle in China, I asked. If people can check and balance the power of the government, then the government can become a force that safeguards world peace. Otherwise, it is a dangerous force. Bao told me that China could not progress politically until the party publicly admitted the Tiananmen Square massacre was wrong. Quote, I feel sad, ashamed, and proud at the same time, he told me. Proud of those students, the citizens of Beijing, the people. After a few minutes, we parted. Bao ambled away. I walked in the opposite direction. That's when I noticed out of the corner of my eye another cameraman with a shoulder bag. From the zippered opening protruded an absurdly large lens. He was a member of a Chinese secret police surveillance team. Bill, Natalie Liu, our Beijing producer, and I quickened our pace slightly, but deliberately. A moment later, I saw a furious man sprinting toward us. He was red with rage and closing fast. We began an undignified trot, but the man kept accelerating and screaming, now waving a fist. I began wondering about Chinese jails as we broke into a full run. The man matched our pace. Natalie and I were falling short of breath when I shouted, what's he saying? What's he saying? He's saying, keep off the grass. <laughs> As a coda to the story, I learned a lesson about how the, how the Chinese uh, ap apparatus works. Nothing happened to Bao. We, we broadcast that. We led the evening news with it. Nothing happened to Bao. Nothing happened to me. Nothing happened to Bill Owens. About three months later, the secret police stormed into Natalie Liu's apartment while she was getting her children ready for school, handcuffed her, took all of her materials, and led her away uh, with no explanation. I, I was traveling with the president in Ireland by this time, and I went to the national security advisor, and I said, you know what? You got to help us out here. Uh, we've got to get her out of there. I don't know if that was what did the trick, but a few days after that, Natalie was deported to the United States, where she's had a long and glorious career at Voice of America. So um, there, there were consequences, but not the ones we expected. That's a fantastic story. Um, so I'd love to uh, invite you all to participate in the conversation. Is anybody uh, in the back? I, please. Um, just make sure you ask a question. <laughs> there should be a question mark at the end of your statement. She wants to hold the mic for me. Uh, Scott, thanks for being here and uh, coming. Can you hear me okay? I hear you just fine. I just can't see you. That's because of the light. Oh, there you are. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Gene Tai with Hexagon. Uh, thanks for being here. Susan Zarensky's just make all kinds of changes with CBS News this past week. I'm sure you're aware of that, all your colleagues at 60 Minutes, which, by the way, I watch religiously, uh, one of my fan big fans of. What, did she call you and ask you for your opinion on what was going on? Or was she going to make some changes? With well, you know, as a matter of fact, that's an interesting question. As a matter of fact, she did. 
Um, I've known Susan for 30 years, and that's only because I've only been at CVS for 30 years. Dan Rather used to say that uh, Susan was delivered uh, as, a, as a baby in a CBS News shipping bag right into the newsroom. Um, she's, she's been there more than 40 years. Um, she is one size too small for petite, but she is the largest presence in any room, and I'm so excited about her being the uh, president of CBS News. It's uh, the first woman president of CBS News, way overdue. Uh, she has made a number of changes in the anchor spots, and I think they're just terrific. I think Nora O'Donnell is uniquely suited to work at the evening news. She has the leadership capability, which is so important to that job because you're sort of uh, like the queen in that job. You know, you're, you're, everybody looks to you for leadership is one thing that I learned in the job, and I think Nora has that uh, in, in innate ability to do that. And I'm really excited about John Dickerson coming to 60 Minutes. John has the interviewing capability of Mike Wallace and the writing capability of Bob Simon. And boy, that's a sweet combination. And he will, he will fit right in to the 60 Minutes uh, cadre of, uh, of correspondence. So I feel really great. We also have a new chairman of the CBS Corporation, a guy that I've known for a very long time, uh, Joe Ionello, who I have enormous confidence in. I'm feeling uh, and now Bill Owens is the executive producer of 60 Minutes. So I feel great about our future. I've known all of these people for decades, and I'm, I'm thrilled about the changes. Thank you again. Um, if you only were accountable to the Constitution, what would you do to control social media? Well, uh, those two th the, the, the two parts of your question are antithetical, aren't they? The, the Constitution uh, does not allow control of the media. Um, in in the, uh, the, the Alien and Sedition Act uh, of 1778, 79, uh, made it uh, illegal to criticize the president or the Congress. <laughs> And uh, that lasted for about two years, and, that, and it was when Madison was writing his commentaries on the Alien and Sedition Act that, uh, that he said that freedom of the press uh, is the only guarantor of, uh, of liberty. And so uh, the Alien and Sedition Act went away uh, in 1800 and figured in the election, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, loss of the election of, by Adams to Thomas Jefferson anyway. Uh, so we haven't had control of the media in that way uh, since. Now, let me get really to the point of your question. Um, we can't control social media. It can't be done. I don't think it can be legislated. I don't think the Constitution would allow it to be legislated. This is, this is freedom of speech in a form that the founders could not have conceived of. But what the founders did understand very well was human nature. And that, in my view, never changes, no matter what the technology is around us. And that's one of the reasons we have the problems we do, because now everyone is a publisher. Uh, everyone is a publisher, and they have no editor. That's a really big problem. Um, and so our first thought is our best thought these days, which, of course, uh, is uh, I counsel young journalists in the book to, to reflect on things. Don't, don't fire off your first shot, your first thought. So I, we can't control it. It won't be controlled. So we have to be very smart about this new information ecosystem that we live in. There are two halves of that. The viewer and the reader has got to take responsibility for what they are consuming and what they believe. We all take care to maybe not smoke and maybe not eat certain things because it's bad for our body. Well, now we've got serious pollution in the information stream, and we need to make the same kind of judgments that that is not good for my brain. And so there's that half of it. The other half is of it is, as journalists, we are trained to expose falsehood. And we have to do that job with greater vigor than ever before. You know, uh, 
Zuckerberg, the president of, um, and founder of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, told Congress that um, he was being grilled on how the Russians had created so many Facebook posts and all of this during the election. And uh, Zuckerberg said, well, you know, uh, figuring out what's true is very hard. Well, yes, it is. <laughs> it's so hard that people go to universities and get degrees in figuring out the truth. Those are called journalism degrees. Some people even get master's degrees. And I think instead of artificial intelligence, which too often is artificial stupidity, we need to have human beings in that loop. If Zuckerberg had hired a hundred journalists to stand in the middle of the information stream, a lot of that stuff never would have gotten passed along because we're all pretty skeptical and we go, wait a minute, what's the source for that? It, the computer can't do that. Artificial intelligence can't do that. You've got to have a human being in there who's trained to do it. And so I think journalism, um, we are about to discover has never been more important in human history. I am Diane Sines, a uh, former Washington Post reporter. Um, there have been reports of um, problems with um, voting systems throughout many US states. What can local journalists do uh, to hold secretaries of state and state legislatures accountable um, to have some sort of paper backup or, or um, a good backup for these election systems? You know, one of the, one of the problems with uh, democracy and liberty is that um, all of the states do their own thing, right? Um, and so that's a great thing, and that's the way our country is organized, but you end up with every state doing something slightly different with regard to election laws and the way they tabulate uh, uh, votes and the way they register voters and all those sorts of things. It's an amazing, crazy quilt, as you know, all across the country. Um, so, but local reporters uh, need to be holding their local county officials' uh, feet to the fire. They need to demand explanations. They need to demand documents uh, that uh, supported the purchasing of one system over another and just dig, 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 dig. Uh, I think that's the only way to do that. So we are coming close to the end of our hour here. Um, before we sign off, I would like to just let you all know of a few upcoming events at the National Press Club on May 30th. We have a book event with the former US Air Force Secretary Deborah Lee James. She's the author of Aim High, Chart Your Courses, Course and Find Success. On Ju June 3rd, we have lunch with EPA Administrator Andrew Wheeler. And on June 19th, we have a newspaper, newsmaker event with House Intelligence Committee Chairman Rep. Adam, Schm Adam Schiff. Excuse me. Um, and I would like to present Mr. Pelly with oh this boy. highly coveted National Press Club <laughs> coffee mug. I have. I have, a, at CBS, I'm pretty famous for my weakness at coffee, uh, okay. weakness for coffee. When I, when I got that job at the Avalanche Journal when I was 15, the coffee in the newsroom was free. Oh, and nice. so, uh, yeah, I've had a terrible addiction ever since. So today is a red letter day. I got a chicken fried steak and a coffee mug, and I'm, I'm going to come visit more often. <laughs> Thank you very, very, very much. Um, so I'm going to give you our final question, which you may have just answered. Um, CBS Saturday morning asked vid visiting chefs who they would like to share a meal with and why. So we would like to ask you those questions. Who would you like to share a meal with and why? Living or dead? Well, I think you get to the <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how small is the universe here? Does it have to be a chef? No. No, I can share a meal with anyone. I can share a meal with anyone. Uh, you know, I... Don't groan. Uh, I would I would choose President Trump. Interesting. Because he why. just fascinates me. I'm I'm serious. What what is going on there, right? Uh, and I I would really like to spend some alone time with no audience around us to just try to understand that psyche a little bit. Um, I uh, did an interview with him during the campaign. And uh, 
he was obfuscating, he was telling outrageous falsehoods in the interview, et cetera, et cetera. But there was one question that I asked him, and for once, his answer was concise and undeniably true. I said, Mr. Trump, you love hearing about yourself. And he said, I do. <laughs> so I'd love to know more about him. I really would. I spend a lot of every day thinking about what's going on in that head. So that wouldn't be a bad one. I guess we'll have cheeseburgers. Probably. <laughs> Thank you very much for being with us, ladies and gentlemen. Scott so Ellis. great. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.